Abby and Pastor Andrew, I met them uh, just in the course of ministry uh, over the last decade or so. And when uh, they told me they were going to uh, uh, have this book and, and, and all these different things, I was like, well, I'd love to have you come to the way. And so I'm just so glad they're here. Um, pa Pastor uh, uh, Gabby is a uh, alumni of Yale Divinity School. Amen. So we got another one of these Yale Divinity folks in the building. Amen. Um, very good comrades. They both are with uh, Minister LaVon, who we know is a great preacher, and she's out in Louisiana somewhere telling the truth to somebody. Somebody say amen. <laughs> amen. Uh, but they both have just recently started a church plant in uh, Brooklyn, New York, called Double Love Experience. And so all of you folks that are trying to get back to the East Coast, to the cold and the snow and the polar vortex, amen. <laughs> I don't want to leave all of this and go there. You have my blessing to go to their church. Somebody say amen. And we hopefully are going to do a lot of great partnership together. But both of them are launching this church. But uh, it is such a blessing to appreciate Pastor Gabby. She has such an amazing array of acknowledgments and accomplishments. She is the inaugural member of the Millennial Womanist Project, a cohort of black women millennial faith leaders across the country. She holds a MDiv from Yale, where she received the Charles Mercick Prize for Preaching Excellence. <laughs> my, my, my. We, we already mentioned the, the Hampton connection, amen. She has a Master's of Arts from New York University, NYU, and she serves on the New York Presbyterian Columbia University Hospital Pastoral Care and Education Advisory Committee. And she was recently inducted into the Academy of Preachers at the Yale Divinity School Alumni. She is a contributing writer to the 2018 book, Mr. President, uh, Interfaith Perspectives on the Historical Presidency of Barack Obama. And they both were most recently featured in Essence Magazine uh, on love and ministry. Now, now, now when, 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 when they were coming, I, I thought they were going to be doing this tag team thing because I've, I've seen this on the Internet before. But they said that we weren't ready for that double anointing just yet. So I guess we're going to have to get that on the second time around. Amen. But we, we, well, it's good to see they got an amen corner. Amen. But we are excited to have these, these wonderful, wonderful folks again. Um, you know, many of you know that uh, The Way is a place that is serious about following the ways of Jesus and transforming the world in which we live. Um, that our faith is not, if our faith is not changing the material conditions of our society and the condition where people live, then our faith is clearly being underutilized. And so I'm so glad to have uh, this wonderful preacher and minister and comrade of the gospel to come and preach the word to us. So stand to your feet, everyone. Put your hands together for the spokeswoman for the king of glory, Pastor Gabby Kujo Wilkes. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Can we give God, while you're clapping, just clap your hands for your incredible pastor. Pastor Michael McBride, we love you. We love you and Lady Sharice as well, Pastor Erna, Pastor Tanisha, um, everyone who makes the way work. Y'all can take your seats. Um, we are so grateful. We are so grateful for their camaraderie, for their friendship. I told the nine o'clock service, we look up to the way. We love what you all are doing. Um, and we're so inspired by your work. Amen. Um, there are so many faces in the building that are family that I am just overcome with emotion right now. Um, I want to thank God for someone who grew up with my husband, so he's basically my brother-in-law, Gervis. Uh, shout out to Gervis. He lives in Oakland. He's family, and he came through, and we're so happy to see him. And then my dear, dear, dear sister, we went to college together. Uh, we have kept a very close friendship. My sister, Mia Hall, uh, came in from L.A. Uh, to be with us. Um, and then shout out to Soul Development, Kariga, Lauren, the whole crew. Uh, Hampton is in the building. I am so excited. Um, I want to center us back on God, amen? Because I feel, I feel like we got a lot of good energy in the room, but I want to make sure y'all don't see me, y'all see Jesus, amen? Um, so do y'all know uh, just any, just give me anything. I don't sing, so I need you to sing for me. Um, but if you can just, if we can just, if we can just worship together real, real quick, Whatever's on your spirit, brother, just, just give us like 30 seconds of something. 
And if y'all can just close your eyes, don't focus on him. He's going to tap in and do what he does. But I believe there's a spirit of worship in this place. Amen. And I want us to, to go to God before we go to this word. Amen. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Come on, just close your eyes and tap into what is happening in the room. The spirit of the Lord is in this place. Hallelujah. Have all of me. Hallelujah. Have all of me. Yeah. Have all of me. Thank you, Jesus. I'm yours. Yeah, that's good. I'll give you all yeah. of me. Hallelujah. You all of me. You all of me. I'm yours. You can have all of me. Come on, just take 30 seconds and think about your week. Think about the weights you want to lay at the altar this morning. Come on, God's about to do something in this place. Hallelujah. If you are your, if God is your all, if he is your everything. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. That's good. Thank you, brother. Hallelujah. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come before you this morning. Everything that we have is yours, oh God. Have your way in this place. Hide me behind the cross. Let the people not see me, but let they indeed see your son, Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you would speak this morning. I pray that you would open up somebody's ears to hear you more clearly. I pray that you would open up somebody's eyes to see you more clearly. God, whatever it is you need to do, do it in this preaching moment, Lord God. We believe that you are present, that you are here, and you want to sit with us. We are yours, oh God, so have your way in this place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Come on and clap your hands and celebrate a God who is present with us. Come on, Emmanuel, God with us. Hallelujah. Stand on your feet real quick and just give God a great praise. Come on, y'all. I know you know that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. I know you know he is a way maker. Come on, celebrate a God who you have declared you are his and he is yours. Come on, the king of glory is here. Who is the king of glory? The Lord God strong and mighty. The Lord God mighty in battle. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel according to Luke chapter 22. We're going to be reading verses 31 through 32 this morning. Luke 22 verses 31 through 32 and it reads, uh, if you're there, say I got it. I think it's up here too. Oh no, not yet. Okay. So, so keep flipping. Keep flipping. Amen. The Gospel according to Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 32, and it reads, Simon, Simon, listen, Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your own faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Strengthen your brothers. Amen. You can take your seats. Amen. My sermon title for this morning is God Sees You. God sees you. Look at somebody to your left and just say, God sees you. Look at somebody to your right and say, God sees you. Amen. Amen. God sees you. My dear brothers and sisters, let me begin this sermon this morning by letting you know that God sees you. You, yes, you, God has seen every battle you have faced. God has heard every prayer you have cried. God has caught every tear you have cried. God sees you. God has listened to your innermost thoughts. God has watched closely as you put one foot in front of the other, even when it was hard for you to get up out of bed, God sees you. God has held you when you didn't want to be held. God has opened doors for you that you thought you wanted to stay shut. God has delighted in you. God has taken a joy within you. God sees you. God cares for you. God has dwelt among you. God has smiled upon you. And you might be wondering, preacher, how do you know God sees me? How do you know God cares? You don't know 
know me. You don't know my story. And I would say to you, I know God sees you. I know God cares because you're still here. I know God sees you because somehow, some way, you walked up into the Wage Christian Center this morning. Somehow, some way, you got out of bed and you put on your clothes and, and you were able to breathe this fresh air and you, you had some water or some orange juice or some coffee this morning and you walked your way into this sanctuary. And so I know I don't have to know your story. I know that because I see you, God sees you. I know because you made it into the house of the Lord this morning that God indeed sees for you. And not only does God God see you, but God cares about you. And in this world that we're living in where everyone is me for me and I for I and I can't help you because I got to help myself, it's important to know that God sees you. Don't you know that in a crowd of people, if you utter a prayer, God can hear your prayer and your neighbor's prayer and your neighbor's neighbor's prayer at the same time? Yes, God sees you. God is imminent enough. God is present enough that even when all others are calling, God will in Indeed, not pass you by God sees you somehow some way you survived whatever it is you went through this week to get here somehow some way you made it somehow some way you haven't died yet church you're still here and God sees you and in our text this morning we find our brother Peter and Peter is wrestling with the fact that God sees him too. Now, now Peter, for those of you who are Bible readers, y'all know that Peter is one of Jesus' 12 disciples. And, and Peter is one of those folks who likes to know some things for himself. I think I got some people in the building who might be able to identify with Peter. You see, Peter doesn't like to take other folks' word for it. Peter likes to find out what he knows for himself. Y'all know those kinds of folks, don't you? The ones who push the limit. The ones who say anything you can do, I can do better. Uh, the ones who aren't satisfied until they've tried it for themselves, that is my friend Peter. And Peter was one of the first disciples that Jesus recruited. Peter was a fisherman. And when Jesus first meets Peter in the gospel according to Luke, Jesus tells Peter the fisherman to put down his net into the water and Peter responds to Jesus, Master, we've worked all night long and we haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I'll let down my nets. And in Luke 5, he lets down his nets. And after he does that, the Bible says they caught, says they caught so much fish that their nets broke. And after that, Peter dropped everything and followed Jesus. I'm talking about Peter. Peter was the one when he was walking with Jesus in the midst of the crowd. He heard Jesus say, who touched me? And Peter said, Lord, it's crowded. Everybody's touching you. But Jesus said, no, no, somebody touched me. I felt the power go out. And then that's when and Peter realized the difference between touching God and having a real encounter with God. I'm talking about Peter. Peter was one of the big three. He was one of the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, that Jesus would take with him when he was going out to minister. And Peter spent intimate time with Jesus. I'm just talking about Peter. When Jesus posed the question, who do men say that I am? It was Peter who said, you are the Messiah. When Jesus went up to the Mount of Transfiguration, it was Peter who said, Master, it's so good up here. Can't we just stay here? But Jesus was like, no, nah, we can't be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. We got to go back down. I'm talking about Peter. Peter, he's the one who walked with Jesus. He's the one who was bold enough to ask his questions. He's the one who, because he asked questions, received his answers. That is the Peter that we meet in our passage for today, Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 32. And so the passage says, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your own faith may not fail. And when you return, strengthen your brothers. My first point this morning, family, the first thing I love about this scripture is that Jesus calls Peter by his government name. 
Okay, all right, all right. Y'all, y'all, y'all stay with me. Y'all, y'all know how like the block calls you something and your family calls you something, but when you fill out your job application, that name may be a little different, right? That's the government name. The government name is when somebody writes you a check, you're like, no, nah, no, nah, don't write that to Pookie. Write that to James Carter the third, right? You you give you give your real name when you really trying to make sure that stuff is on the up and up, right? And, and so and so what I love about this passage is that Jesus calls Peter his government name. So y'all, y'all stay with me because in the Bible, the Bible says that Jesus changed, changes Simon's name from Simon to Peter back in Luke chapter 5. And right now we're in Luke chapter 22, right? So somebody said that's old news, right? Like why are you bringing up old stuff, Jesus? You changed his name in Luke chapter 5. But in this passage, Jesus calls him Simon. And I want to help somebody this afternoon. I want to talk to some brother or sister who's trying to make sure God was talking to you when God told you whatever God told you. When God spoke to you, you maybe weren't sure if God meant you. Maybe God meant your neighbor. Maybe God meant your friend. But I want to let you know that when God wants to get your attention, God will call you by every name that you've ever gone by to make sure you know that God is talking to you. That's why we know that God God sees us because every now and again when you out there in the streets and somebody calls you by a name you didn't tell them was your name don't you turn around real quick like wait, wait. only my mama calls me that like how, how you know me who who introduced you to me right and so Jesus says Simon Simon the devil wants to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. My dear brother, my dear sister, God knows you well enough to call you by every name. Your past name, your current name, your future name. You know what that means? That means God's not afraid of your past. God's not afraid of whatever you did before the folks at the way met you. I've got, I got a witness up in here. God is not afraid of your history. As a matter of fact, God loves your history so much that he calls you by the name you were born into and listen y'all names have meanings names come with baggage that's why we don't like folks calling us out of our name right when somebody calls you something you don't want to be called those are fighting words in the streets because your name means something but God sees you enough to call you by your government name by the name your mama and your daddy and your grandmama gave you to make sure that you know that God is talking to you. Come on and clap your hands for a God that sees you enough to talk to you directly, to talk to the you that you try to hide from everybody else. Scripture says, Simon, Simon. But point number two, not only that does God call uh, Peter by his government name, Simon. Point number two, God warns him that he is about to face some trouble. And, and, and I love this, I love this because you know, if, if, if I'm about to face some calamity, right, if I'm about to walk into some real hard stuff, if somebody's not going to get me out of it, the next best thing they can do is tell me it's coming. Yeah. Amen? Because, because if you're not telling me you're going to pull me out of it, but you tell me it's coming, I can prepare myself. Right. And, and so we all know that, you know, God has the power to decide what God is going to do and how God is going to bless us. So God doesn't always take us out of stuff. But how many of you are glad that when you pray to God every now and again, God will give you a sign every now and again. God will tell you to gird up your loins and put on your your put on your armor because you got a fight ahead of you. But you're going to win this thing. You're going to be victorious in Jesus name. But something is coming against you. So point number two, God warns him that he is about to face some trouble. So Jesus tells Peter, Satan has demanded to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you. Now, in 2019, sift you as wheat really doesn't mean a whole lot to us, right? I, I, I really have to confess that in preparation for this message, I was like, sift you as wheat really means nothing to me. But I feel like based on how it's written, it's supposed to be a bad thing, right? So, right, so I, had to, I had to go into my, my research mode. Uh huh. But back in those days, bread was one of the things that accompanied almost every meal. People ate bread often. And in order to make bread, you had to have some flour. Somebody shout flour. And flour was made from wheat. And so it was necessary for the flour to be poured over a mesh screen and shaken vigorously 
in order to trap and expose the impurities from the wheat. This was how they created pure flour, and that flour was what they were used to make their daily bread. So when Jesus told Peter that Satan wanted to sift him at wheat, as wheat, Jesus was really saying, Peter, Satan wants to shake you up. Satan wants to trap you. Satan wants to expose you. But I have prayed for you. Y'all miss your cue to shout. Jesus said, Peter, Satan wants to shake you up. Satan wants to trap you. Satan wants to expose you. But I have prayed for you. I'm going to say that one more time. Jesus said, Peter, Satan wants to shake you up. Satan wants to trap you. Satan wants to expose you. But I have prayed for you. Come on, somebody pray for me. Had me on their mind. Took the time to pray for me. I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed. Your mama prayed. Your grandmama prayed. Your granddaddy prayed. Jesus himself is praying for you. Satan. The, said the devil wants to shake you up. Peter, the devil wants to shake you up and trap you and expose you. But I have prayed for you. Is there anybody in here that's grateful for a savior who will take some time to intercede for you? Come on, the Bible says that he is sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty where he makes intercession for us. So, 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 so Jesus cares about Peter enough to warn him. And, and, you know, I want to pause here because, you know, a lot of times as Christians, we get it twisted. We try to expose people's stuff, right? But, 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 but in this passage, Jesus is saying that Satan wants to trap you, right? Satan wants to expose you. Satan wants to put all your stuff out there. But I have prayed for you. And, and that's powerful, y'all. I don't want you to miss that because, you know, we don't, we don't celebrate dirt, right? We, we want to be better. But we do celebrate a Savior who's more concerned about our well-being than exposing us, right? Because sometimes we get so fixated on what people have done wrong and we forget Jesus himself is praying for us. Jesus himself is interceding for us to do better, Right? And, and so that's what, we, that's what we focus on. So, so point number one, he called him by his government name. Point number two, he uh, made sure uh, that he warned Peter. And, and, and point number three, Jesus prayed that his faith would not fail. I love that. And I'm going to tell you why I love that. I love that because it assumes that Peter had faith in the first place. And let me talk to some people in here who feel like you've messed up one too many times. Let me talk to some people in here who feel like, man, I've been a Christian a long time. I shouldn't keep, I shouldn't be getting trapped up by the same stuff, right? But Jesus prayed that Peter's faith would not fail. That means that Jesus assumed that Peter already has some kind of faith that got him to this point. And you remember when we started, we talked about all the ways that Peter had walked with Jesus, all the ways that Peter had asked his questions and pushed Jesus and gotten his answers. Like, Peter's not new to this. And so he's got a little bit of faith, right? And the Bible says that all you need is faith the size of a mustard seed to move mountains, amen? But sometimes we overlook that. Sometimes we feel like we got to have all the faith in the world to make some changes. But Jesus prayed that his faith would not fail. And so I want to encourage you today that whatever little bit of faith you can muster is enough for Jesus to move in your life. 
Whatever little bit of doubt you can push out of your mind enough to believe something better is enough for Jesus to work for you. You see, Jesus is not only interceding that you won't mess up. Jesus is interceding that your faith will not fail. Jesus is interceding that you will still believe that better is possible. Jesus is still interceding on your behalf to help you see yourself as victorious. He wants you to see yourself as a conqueror, as someone that is able to overcome, as someone that is able to achieve. And so the Bible says that Jesus prayed that his faith will not fail. And y'all know that passage that we love so much in Hebrews. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so Jesus prays that your faith does not fail. And I too pray that your faith does not fail. And as I close, I'm reminded of a popular story. I'm sure those of you in this room, some of you may have heard it. One night a man had a dream. He dreamed that he was walking along the beach with the Lord. Across the sky flashed scenes from his life. For each scene, he noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonged to him and the other belonged to God. When the last scene of his life flashed before him, he looked back at the footprints in the sand. He noticed that many times along the path of his life, there was only one set of footprints. He also noticed that the single set of footprints that happened to be there were at the very lowest parts of his life and the saddest parts of his life. And this bothered him, this bothered him, so he questioned God about it. And he said, Lord, you said that once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I have noticed that during the most troublesome times in my life, there is always one set of footprints. And I don't understand how you could leave me in the most vulnerable and hard, hard times of my life. And the Lord replied, my precious, precious child, I love you and I would never leave you during your times of trial and suffering when only you could see one set of footprints. It was there that I carried you. And that's all I came to tell y'all this morning. God is a very present help in our time of need. He will never leave you or forsake you. So in your time of trouble, look unto the hills from whence cometh your help. Your help comes from the Lord. God sees you. God's praying for you. God knows you by name. God believes that your faith will not fail. God knows that you're going to make it. God knows that you're going to come through some trials. God knows you're going to be hard on yourself but God has prayed for you that your faith would not fail God has prayed for you that your faith would not fail that your faith would not fail that your own faith would not fail and I think about Psalm 121 I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help my help cometh from the Lord the Lord who made heaven and earth he will not suffer thy foot to be moved he will keep thy slumber nor sleep the Lord Lord is my keeper. The Lord is the shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall prepare thy going out and preserve thy coming in this now and forevermore. And as the song says, all of my hell, all of my hell, all of my help, all of my help, all of my help, all of my help, every little bit of my help, that help, and this help, and that help, all of my help comes from the Lord. Clap your hands in this place. Oh, come on. God sees you. God's helping you. God's got your back. God knows what you're going through. God ain't going to let you fail. God knows Satan wants to get at you, but he has prayed for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The devil wants to trap you, to expose you, but God himself, Jesus himself, is interceding for you. Do I just want y'all to get a picture, right? So, so you got God the Father, right? You got God the Son. You got God the Holy Spirit, right? So Holy Spirit is with us in you, right? After you get saved, the Holy Spirit's in you. God the Father has been like running things forever and ever and ever and ever, right? Then you got Jesus, right? The Son. The one who literally comes to earth in flesh 
decides to be fully human while still being fully divine, right? Which means he's God enough to stop what he experiences, but he's human enough to feel it. And he chooses to feel it because the task before him is to be human, to be God wrapped up in flesh. So that when you pray, you're not praying to a God that's not acquainted with what it's like to be human. And let me talk to some intellectuals in the building because, you know, every now and again, folks try to make us seem like God don't care about you. Why would God care about this little exam you got to study for? Why would God care about, you know, the, the, the job that you put the application in for? Well, God cares because God actually sent God's self in flesh form. So God has felt this before. So when you think about the Trinity, the part of God that has lived life is the part of God that is interceding on your behalf. The, the one who has felt pain, the one who has felt hardship, the one who has been cast aside, the one who was an outcast, the one who was pushed away, the one who nobody understood, the one who was killed, the one who people turned on, the one who was crucified, the one whose friends turned their back on him, that one, that part of the Trinity is the one who went back to heaven and is like, come on God, like, like I've been there, please take care of them. Come, come on, Dad, like, I, I, I've been in that situation before. They gonna make it. They, it looks like they're not, but they gonna make it. I got them. Please, just, 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 just make a pathway for them. Just, just help them. That He's literally interceding on your behalf, and he's got history. He's been here before. He has walked this life before. He had a mama and a daddy. He had some brothers. He had some friends. He had to cry sometimes. He had to weep sometimes. He had to eat. He was human so that when he intercedes for us, he's intimately connected to our humanity while still being divine. That means whatever you're praying about is not too small because Jesus has lived it. And not only has Jesus lived it, but he's interceding to his father. Anybody come from a big family where like you get in trouble and your siblings try to go to your parents before you? And they'd be like, he, he's sorry, he didn't mean it. He didn't, he, he, he's already, like, he been crying for the past two hours. Like, come on, please, like, like, like don't whip him because he already feels bad enough, right, right? Jesus is our big brother. Going to God every time we mess up. Being like, God, I know, I know. And like, I'm God too, but I'm also, you know, I also did that human thing and I get it. I get where they are. I've been where they are. And I believe their faith ain't going to fail them. I believe they've been through enough stuff that at a particular point it's going to snap back in, it's going to click back in. And y'all know the story, right? Uh, Peter actually does deny Jesus, right? So, so in this passage, it's not only predicted, but it happens. Peter says, no, nah, Lord, I ain't, I ain't never, I got your back. You my boy, like, we good, right? And then when Jesus is uh, taken by the Roman soldiers and, and, and the folks say to Peter, hey, ain't you one of his boys? Like, aren't you one of the disciples? Peter says three times, no, that's not me. And doesn't even realize that this is what was predicted would happen. He doesn't realize this is the sifting, right? And, and, so, and so Peter denies Jesus three times, and after the third time, the Bible says that he realizes what he had done, and he's so ashamed of himself, and he can't believe it, and he thought that he would never be the one to turn on Jesus, and y'all, when times get hard, we got to be careful about putting ourselves on pedestals, because everybody has the capacity to fall, right? That's, that's how we mess up. When we put people on such a high pedestal that we think that they can't fall, all of us have the capacity because we're all human, right? But let me give y'all some good news. When Jesus is resurrected from the dead and the women see him and then the disciples see him, when he sees the disciples, he says, go get the rest of the disciples and Peter. Jesus intentionally asks for Peter after Peter messes up. Because he knows that Peter is in the corner somewhere so ashamed with what he has done. And Jesus is like, yo, I already prayed for you. I already told you that I prayed that your faith wouldn't fail. So do you feel bad about what you did? You gonna do it again? Not nah, cool. So we good. Go get Peter, right? And so tonight, there might, today, there may be somebody in the room, and I'm done, but there might be somebody in the room who feels like, I can't keep asking for forgiveness. I, 
I can't keep coming back to God. Y'all, that's not how any of this works, right? The way it works is, it doesn't matter how many times you mess up. Jesus has been here already. Jesus was crucified already. Jesus took all our sins upon himself already. So all you got to do is repent and remember that Jesus the Christ himself is interceding on your behalf. God sees you. God's praying for you. And you're going to make it. God bless you. Come on, let's stand to our feet, everyone.